the few, the proud, the Marines. <laughs> Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the triune God. Amen. Amen. There's a Zen proverb that says, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. <laughs> Martin Luther might say, before baptism, love and do your vocation. After baptism, love and do your vocation. But the new enlightenment might very well say, before COVID-19, chop wood and carry water. After COVID-19, chop wood, carry water, use plenty of hand sanitizer, play it safe, hunker down, raid Costco. <laughs> You're probably thinking about cleanliness in ways that you've never thought about it before, or not in years at any rate. At Bishop Jake's recommendation, I read an online article by a woman named Emmy Yang, and the article was entitled, What Martin Luther Teaches about Us About Coronavirus. Faced in his day with a sudden outbreak of the Black Plague, he was asked, is it okay for me to run away from this? And he decided to give it an answer. This is the gist of it. Luther answers, first of all, that all those with a vocational duty in health care should definitely stay on and serve the humans that are diseased and in need. Then he says, those whose vocation is ministry, they should remain with the sick and the dying because they are being good shepherds and those who are passing should not be denied the service of communion. After this, Luther says public officials ought to stay on, such as mayors and judges. We need to maintain the public and civic order Public servants like uh, uh, city-sponsored physicians or police officers, they need to stay on and carry out their professional duties. Even parents have a duty to their children to care and protect and cover them. Where there may be a shortage of health care workers, Luther says, that lay citizens without any medical training, they could stay on and provide care for the sick. And that would be an opportunity to minister to Christ himself. Luther defends such public health measures as quarantines and seeking medical attention when it's available. In fact, he proposes to us that we should never, ever, ever act recklessly in all our social interactions with one another. God has gifted us human beings with bodies. And it is a God on a honoring, worshipful thing for us to take care of our bodies and protect these gifts. Finally, he nails down the really real answer that he was being asked. Is it okay to run away from a diseased city? Luther says, absolutely, yes it is, it may be the faithful thing to do However, first, only if your neighbor is not in immediate danger. <laughs> and second, only if you can arrange substitutes for yourself for others who will care for the sick and nurse them in your place. <laughs> Luther proposes this worshipful paradox. It's honoring to God for us to take care of our physical health and do all the necessary precautions but it's honoring to God even more to keep an open heart and keep in view those opportunities that come to us to love and to serve our neighbor in the face of danger. As we proceed now through all these unknowns of what's going on in our time and day, we proceed together. We don't grab our cart, run for the last roll of toilet paper, shouting every man for himself. <laughs> By way of example, Luther himself remained in the plagued city to care for the sick and the dying. And it's also the same 
illustration that Jesus gives us this morning in the Gospel reading. That's the example he sets. That's the bar he holds up. Why is that? Because in Jesus' time, the Samaritans were the, co uh, the coronavirus. In Jesus' time, they were the Black Plague. And how did this stigma even come about? Back in the 700s BCE, when the Assyrians came in and conquered northern Israel, they led into captivity the Israelite people, but then they repatriated the land with their own pagan worshipers. Some people left in the land to fend for themselves, intermarried with these new pagan population here, and they became what we know as the Samaritans. The Samaritans felt like they were, had, um, excuse me, let me say it this way. The Samaritans, as they were called, were of a mixed and impure blood, and they were of, of a mixed religion, though they claimed to be legitimate on both counts. To the first century Jews, the Samaritans were a race that was fearfully despised and socially ostracized. They saw them as claimants to God's kingdom, illegitimate claimants. And you know what the pejorative term is for illegitimate claimants. It was an offense to have any social intercourse with the Samaritans. It was an offense to touch or use one of the same objects that they would use. Remember that the woman says to Jesus, I can't give you any water, you don't even have a bucket. She could not allow him to touch the bucket that she had. It was against their law. It was especially forbidden for a religious master like Jesus to initiate a contact, and all the worse because this Samaritan was a woman. You remember when the Jews called Jesus a Samaritan and a devil? They were leveling at him the very most, uh, uh, what's the word? Offensive. Worst, offensive <clears throat> insult that they could give him. And there the, was a widely used Jewish proverb that said a piece of bread given by a Samaritan is more unclean than any swine's flesh. <laughs> Samaritans then were unclean. They were established as wholly unclean, racially, ritually, permanently. As a people group, they were despised and they were feared like an invading virus. So they needed to be locked down and isolated and quarantined to their own territory, and they were eyed with suspicion and contempt. They were a human disease. Okay, how are you feeling this morning? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the news as it comes to us kind of creates this stain, this stamp that comes on our soul. We would try not to cave into fear, but that's an incredibly hard temptation to overcome at times. I have a little cough. What does that mean to me? You know, what's going on? Or I think I have a little cough, or there's a tickle in my throat, or there's a made up tickle in my throat. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're thinking all these things. And then there's something about you that, you know, feel if that's the case, then you kind of feel like, you're unclean to everybody else. Don't, don't touch me. Don't come near me. I don't, don't, don't interact with me. And everything's out of control, and you don't know where it came from, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, what happens in today's gospel is the disciples go out to buy some food. They leave Jesus to himself. And one of the locals, of course, the woman, comes to fetch the water for herself. And so to, into this infected people, they were infected by the hatred of others, Jesus inserts himself. He finds a way to insert himself. Worn and weary from his travels, he asks a favor. He says, give me a drink. I'm really struck by the humble neediness and vulnerability that Jesus expresses here. He makes his approach, give me a drink. 
St. Augustine famously said that you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. But turn the tables on that. Here's Jesus saying those words to the Samaritan. I have made you for myself, O mortal woman, and my thirsty heart can only be sated by you. Give me a drink. Think about it. The one human on the planet who is God in flesh is expressing weakness and broken neediness, simply asking, will you give me a drink? But Jesus has no bucket. He needs her bucket. The only way for him to meet his need and slake his thirst and revive his body and refresh his soul is for him to share from her bucket, from her hated, unclean, contaminated Samaritan bucket. He must receive her exactly as she is, and that is just what he does. Hmm. That's when she discovers she is able to carry on this conversation, this continuing honest conversation with God's Messiah, even though shameful truths may be exposed. Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Romans 5 eight says that God proves his love for us so that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Okay, a second idea that really strikes me from this passage is the fact that Jesus is the one who provides for her a drink. And he has no water that he can share. He doesn't have a bucket. But he shares such words of life that are an effervescent fountain springing up from within, and she catches this message that he has to give, and it begins to spring up inside her own heart and soul. He says, the water that I will give you will become in you a fountain of gushing up water to eternal life. So this woman says, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty, so that I can never have to keep coming here to draw water. And as he doesn't answer that, really, he says, go find your husband. But as if to provide an answer, I thought of this verse from the book of Revelation where this, it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let everyone who hears say, Come. Let everyone who's thirsty come. Let everyone who wishes take of the water of life as a free gift. In other words, just come. Because the water that you seek, God's word, is already a free gift for you. feeling strained or extra stressed, if you're feeling unclean on account of anxiety or worry and fear, or you're just feeling contaminated by the six o'clock news, <laughs> you can remember that God's word is our great heritage and shall be ours forever. What word is that? It's the word by which the Holy Spirit communicates with you to your heart, down in the center of your being. Down at the point of your need, the word which says, you are forgiven. To you, I give you my peace. You are mine forever. You are very holy. You're in the palm of my hand. You are safe beyond measure and for all time, and nothing can separate you from my love. So Psalm 91 is another Example, it's an assurance of God's protection. And so I will close with these words. Please listen and take in these promises for yourself. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, You are my fortress, my refuge, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Hmm. You will not fear 
the terror of the night? Or the arrow that flies by day? Or the pestilence that stalks in darkness? Or the destruction that wastes at the noonday? A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. No scourge shall come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you on all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot those who love me. I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be that with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Amen. Amen. Are you thirsty? 